statements uh, in this house over the last several weeks. And God, we believe that tonight there is going to be another uh, move of the Holy Ghost that takes place in this service. I pray, God, from the very beginning to the very end that you would do what you want to do in this house. Saturate our minds, God, with clarity that we could understand what the Word is going to be uh, taught tonight. Lord, I pray that you would anoint our hearts to receive what is spoken in this house. I pray, Lord, against every distraction, everything that would hinder what you're wanting to do in our presence. Lord, we want you to have your perfect will and your perfect way, God. Let there be a perfect focus that's loosed in this house, that we would focus in on what is being spoken, that we would grab hold of that, that we would take that to our homes, that we would carry that with us throughout the remainder of this week. God, that we would engraft it as our identity, as who we are, Lord. We thank you for another opportunity to come into your presence and to worship you. Irrelevant, God, of what happens before this service is over, let it be said that we gave our best. We gave our best in prayer. We gave our best in worship. God, that we gave our best in what we could give you tonight in our giving and in our effort. I pray uh, that you would bless every area of this service and continue to minister and to move. Uh, I know it's a Wednesday night, but I would that you would continue to lift your voice and clap your hands. Uh, right now, the Lord is an awesome God. Amen. On this Wednesday night, the Lord can do anything in this house. Could you magnify Him? Lift your voice unto Him right now. Lord, we worship You. God, we offer up worship before You before we go another step further. We want to magnify You. We want to exalt You, Lord, for You're worthy uh, of our worship. Um, come on, if He's been good to you, wouldn't you let Him know? Um, would you let Him know, Jesus, You've been mighty good to me, uh, and I lift You up. Uh, and I magnify you in this house. Uh, hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. I worship you, God. Uh, oh, you're a mighty God. Uh, you're a wonderful God. Uh, oh, you're a counseling God. Uh, we love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Amen. I would that you would continue in the spirit of worship as the praise team sings.
Are we glad we serve a covenant keeping God? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, welcome to church. There's already a sweet spirit of the Holy Ghost in this place. I'm thankful to serve a God that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think. I've got a pretty good imagination and God's able to go far above anything, anything that I can imagine. So welcome to church on a Wednesday night where anything can happen. <clears throat> if you have a need, I present to you a God that can do anything you need. All right, so shop around, <clears throat> find someone, speak to them, greet them in the name of Jesus. And let's worship with the praise team. And I wonder if one more time we could give the Lord a hand clap of praise all across this sanctuary. And now can you add your voice and begin to magnify him? Yes, God, you're worthy to be magnified, worthy to be praised. You are the only saving king, the only savior, Jesus. And I'll go ahead and give you the scripture for tonight. We're excited to continue this next lesson in this series. And tonight we'll be talking about the parable of the laborers. And you, if you will, be making your way in your Bible to Matthew chapter 20. And we will be reading verses 1 through 16. And as you're turning, and 
And I pay great honor to our pastor and first lady. Don't we love and appreciate them? Amen. Also, I will say as well, I really do appreciate everyone's prayers this past weekend for my wife. I'm excited that she is feeling better and able to join us in the house of God tonight. And I'm also excited that it is getting colder outside and it is sweater weather. And I can look like a knockoff community college English professor. I was thinking earlier, looking in the mirror, trying to make sure everything was fitting right. I was thinking, I'm the embodiment of Professor Plum from the game Clue. But I love the cold weather. I love it. I'm so thankful that it is not burning hot. I'm thankful that our state bird, the mosquitoes, are finally going away. I'm thankful that I don't sweat as soon as I open my front door. Something about cold weather and a cup of coffee is just absolutely wonderful in the morning. I love this time of year. Love and appreciate each and every single one of you. And we're going to go ahead and read this here. I know we do have a little bit of a lengthy reading. Uh, we have a few verses here. So let's read together. Verse number one says, For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into the, his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went their way. Again he went out about the sixth and ninth hour and did likewise and about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle and saith unto them, Why stand ye here I all the day idle? And I say unto him, Because no man hath hired us. He saith unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. And so when even was come, the Lord of the vineyard saith unto his steward, Call the laborers, and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. And when they came that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. But when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more. And they likewise received every man a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured against the goodman of the house, saying, These last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst not thou agree with me for a penny? Take that thine is, and go thy way. I will give unto this last, even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil, because I am good? So the last shall be first, and the first last. For many be called, but few chosen. Amen. Tonight we are going to talk about the laborers, and we will talk about this for just a little while. But I believe God's got something great. Pastor, if you'd pray for us tonight. If you would, clap your hands all across this house one more time. Amen, amen, and you may be seated. So I can imagine that this, this owner, as he woke up in the morning, he, he just knew it was the time of harvest, and he, he began to look around, and he, he saw his fields, he saw his vineyards, and he said, there's more work than just what I can do. There's more work here to do than just what I have around me of those to already to help me. And, and so he put on his clothes and he went out to the marketplace and he began to find people to help. And, and this was one thing that we need to understand about that time is that the marketplace was where a lot of people, if they needed a job, that's where they were going to go. Because unfortunately back then there was not many jobs that actually were, was long-term employment. There was not many contracts handed out back then for, okay, you're going to work for five years, you're going to work for ten years, you're going to work for however long it may be. A lot of these people had to work just day by day and get what they could get and just work to make a living. And, and so they would find themselves around 6 a.m. in the marketplace, and then they would be hired for what are the, whatever the job may be. And one day this owner comes along and he says to these men, hey, I, I need some help. And he looked at these guys and he saw they look like they're strong guys and, and harvest can be pretty rough. 
Harvest, it, it takes a lot of work. It's hard work, and it's back-breaking work. You've got to bend over each plant, inspect every single grape. You've got to inspect every single thing to make sure that it's ready to pick and that it's not just going to go to waste because he knew that if he had their help, then he would be able to gather more than he ever could on his own because if he didn't have help, the, the grapes or whatever it was that he was growing in his vineyard would just be sitting there and they would eventually fall off the vine. They would rot by themselves because there was nobody to pick them. And he needed these laborers. He saw that they looked like strong young men who actually could, you know, bend over without hurting their knees and without hurting their backs and begin to carry large baskets of these grapes from place to place. And after they started working, after a few hours, he, he realized that there's more work than, than what they can accomplish and what I can accomplish. So the Bible says that, he went back to the marketplace around the third hour, and that would have been around 9 a.m., and he found some more workers there, and he said, hey, come on, I've got a job for you to do, and I need some help. And so he took them back to his vineyard, and he said, okay, you see those guys over there, you know, go, go help them. They need some help. And then eventually, again, the same thing repeats at the sixth hour and the ninth hour, and then even at the 11th hour, that would have been around 5 p.m., he notices that there's still a whole lot of work to be done and so that he needs more help. And, and, and so he begins to go out there and find, even at that last hour, more help for the vineyard. And, and as we compare the vineyard from this biblical passage to today, we, we recognize that God's harvest is filled with souls ready to become his. And these people need to hear the word of God. And God, God's field may not always be easy to harvest, but he needs laborers in the field. And we look at this in Romans chapter 10, verse 14, and it says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And a lot of times I know we harp on this world that they misinterpret verses so much so that now there's plenty of false doctrine to go around. But I, I believe we all misinterpret this verse because we see this in the last part and it says, how shall they hear without a preacher? And so we all automatically think, well, that it just means it's pastor's job. It just means it, it's Brother Ballantyne's job, Brother Collins's job, Brother Larry's job. It's someone's job that's what we call a preacher to reach these souls and to teach about Jesus. And so I begin to ask Brother Google about what is the definition of a preacher? And you'll never guess what it told me. Someone who preaches. Thank you, Brother Google. So I, I clicked on, okay, what's the definition of preach? And it said that the definition of preach is to publicly proclaim or to teach or to earnestly advocate. And, and I believe that's one thing that we have to understand about this passage of scripture in Romans chapter 10 is that we may not fit the stereotypical bill of a preacher but each and every single one of us are called to earnestly advocate for souls in this world we're all called to publicly pro pro proclaim the word of God and, and I think it's very interesting that a lot of us will say that well I, 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 I don't have a fancy title God didn't call us to have fancy titles he called us to love souls he called us to earnestly advocate for his word, for the souls out there, for the lost, and bring them into his kingdom. And I wonder if there's someone in this house today that can stretch your hand toward heaven and say, God, that's me. I may not be what, the, what we would fit the bill of a preacher, but God, I want to earnestly advocate for a lost soul out there. I want to publicly proclaim the word of God. I, when I walk out the doors, I want to live the word of God and show it to this world. We find in this world that we are, especially with the things that are going on, we're, we're witnessing a hunger that's being created in this world unlike ever before. And, and it's something that people, some people just don't know how to feel. And so they're trying to find any form, any fashion of spiritualism to fill that void. Some even turn to such things as witchcraft, hoping to fill that, that hole in that void that's in their heart and in their spirit. But all again, all the while, we know that it's, that's, that hole in their heart and spirit is a Jesus-shaped hole. It's a Jesus-shaped void that they need. And, and we know as born-again Christians that we know exactly what they need. So it is our job to go out these doors of the church and begin to proclaim inside the fields of the harvest what the Word of God says. And it, in the Bible says actually something very interesting. We, it says that you know, there may be people out there in this world that, it, that call themselves Christians, that call themselves saved, and, 
and they look at the people around them and say, you know what, they, they've made too many mistakes and I, I, I just don't know about them. I don't want to be around them. I, 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 I'm, I'm better than that. I, I, I'm going to sit here with my buttoned up jacket and I, I, I'm, I'm better than that. I don't have to reach them. But the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 11, And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified. And I can remember a time when I was drinking. I can remember a time when I was living up the party lifestyle. I can remember a time when I didn't deserve the mercy and the grace of God, but somebody realized that I needed a Savior. Someone realized that I needed their, pray or their prayers. Someone realized that I needed their arms wrapped around me in love and their, in their spirit and in their soul. And I wonder in this house tonight if there's anybody that can say, I know what I used to be, but I also know what God brought me out of and what he's called me to be. I know exactly where I am in the kingdom of God, and it's to reach out into the harvest and be a laborer in the field. I want to reach somebody that needs the word of God. I love it that God uses our past experiences to actually make us overcomers. And the Bible says that we're made overcomers by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. What we see as faults and failures and mistakes of our past, God sees as a testimony. What we see as things that we could have done better, God sees as, guess what, I'm using you and giving you authority over that because I've called you out of that. And now I'm going to send you out into the field. I'm going to draw the souls to you, but it's your job to teach them. It's your job to reach them. It's your job to preach to them. And it's your job to live the gospel and to actually show them what a true Christian is supposed to be. And we find that this great hunger for God all around us, especially, like I said, in, in times of chaos, we, we see biblical prophecy being fulfilled almost every single day now, and, and we realize that we're closer to the coming of the Lord than ever before. And, and I am at the point now, in times past, and years past, I knew we were close, and, but I questioned you know, if I would actually see it in my lifetime, and now I truly believe I will probably see it in my lifetime with the things unfolding. And, and it, it can see that it can make us think, just thinking of that, a lot of people, especially I know when I was younger, I would not want to think about the return of, of Jesus coming in that point in time because I, it, it just made me think in my mind, it, it, let me actually make sure I'm ready. Let me actually make sure I've got everything right. And I just don't want to think about that because it makes me think that every, I just know everything's going to change. It's weird to think about that, but I also have to realize that God called us to the kingdom for such a time as this. We were not called to be here 50 years ago, but we were called, all of us, to be here in this time, in this age, in this day, to actually fulfill the labors that are needed in the field. And as we stated earlier, in, in biblical times, those desiring work would get up early and they would go to the marketplace hoping that someone would just pick them. And there were those at the beginning of the day that were lucky enough to be picked. All the while, I, I can imagine that there were the, still those men out there trying to find work and that no one would just pick them. And, and, and they were thinking, how am I going to feed my family today? How am I going to actually make it to the next day? How am I going to actually survive? Am I... I one of my worst fears ever since I became a father, and all the fathers can actually attest to this, that one of, your, one of the things that you strive to do is you want to make sure the bellies of your kids are full. I, I can't imagine what those fathers must have been thinking that day that I, I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to feed my kid today. I don't know if I'm going to be able to take care of my wife today. I, I, I just don't know how we're going to make it, all because they just didn't have the right look. Someone over there may have thought, well, that person's too short or, or that person's not wearing the right kind of clothes. That person doesn't just look like the kind of person I want to be around, and so they just weren't picked. But then throughout the day, the landowner, he actually decided to come back, and he said, hey, I want you. And then again, there were still those in the marketplace wondering, why didn't he pick me? And then three hours later, he comes back and says, I want you. Then later on throughout the day, especially when it gets to the 11th hour, he's asking these men, why are you just standing around idle all day? And, and I can just, when I read the scripture, I can just almost feel the heartbreak in them because no one, no one picked us. No one wanted us. 
But I'm thankful that there's a God who sends laborers out there and says, you know what? Every single person has a place in my kingdom. Every single person has a place in my harvest. No matter how they look like, no matter how they smell like, no matter what they may have made, the mistakes they may have made in their past, everybody is part of the harvest of God. I'm thankful that whenever I was the way I was, that God didn't just see me as a mistake. He saw me as a harvest. I'm thankful that when God saw you, he didn't see the sins that you made, but he saw a harvest. And I pray that we all get in our mindset and in our spirit that when we walk out those doors, we don't see the mistakes that people made, but we look at people and we see a harvest. Because one of the most fulfilling things ever is actually whenever God, you realize that God says, hey, I want you. A lot of people in this world do things to just feel wanted. And I wonder what kind of revival we would find ourselves in as a worldwide church if we would just get out there and show people the love of God that he actually still wants them regardless of the sins that they've committed because there is a way to actually wash away those sins and be made new into what he's called you to be. And then we find that at the end of the day, even the ones who were only working for one hour as they begin to go to the owner and he, they began to line up ones who'd been there the shortest all the way to the end were the ones who had been there the longest. They began to line up and, and he, and the landowner, he began to pay everybody the same amount, regardless of the ones who had worked an hour or regardless of the ones who had worked a full 12 hours, they all received a penny. And I'll be honest with you. I think we can all be honest with ourselves. If we were the one of the ones that were picked first in the morning, realizing the amount of work that we've done, We'd think that that's kind of unfair. I, I know I can confidently say I would think that that's extremely unfair. I mean, they've literally been here 45 minutes. Half the time they were just trying to find out what they needed to do, but they're still making the same amount that I'm making even though I've been out here sweating. I'm out here dirty. I'm out here, you know, my back's hurting now. My knees are give out. My legs are give out. My arms are give out. And, and they're making the same as me. They barely even broke a sweat. Uh, I, I would kind of be upset. And, again, I've heard this parable in a couple of different ways. And, and the first way is one that I've heard probably the most. And, and it's about regardless of how long you've been in church, you can still be used by God. Amen. There are people in this house, and I'm thankful for each and every single one of you, who have labored for decades in this truth and in this gospel and tried to reach souls. And regardless if we've been in church for 40 years or 40 minutes, God has a calling upon each and every single one of us in this room tonight, and God can use us in whatever way he wishes. And, and I, I told the young people this on this past Sunday. You know, I, I've, I've been back in church now for a little over 13 years. And if there's areas of the spirit, areas of God that I still haven't been used in yet, but if I saw one of them being used in, in that place, area that I had not been used at, I don't want to be jealous. Well, I, I, I'm the youth pastor after all. I'm the one that's over them. Why are they being used of God and not me? Time is not a factor for God. Those kind of things are not a factor for God. God gives liberally as he sees fit. It's his to give. It's his to actually distribute. And I'm thankful for a God, regardless if we, again, if we've been in church for 40 years or 40 minutes, that God sees us as vessels that he can use. Can anybody actually clap your hands and say, I'm thankful that God uses me. And just like most of us would, these workers who came at the first part of the day, they, they began to actually murmur and, and talk to themselves. I wonder what's going on. Did you see what he gave them? They shouldn't have got that. And eventually one of them worked up the courage and went to the owner and said, I, I don't think it's fair, sir, that you paid them the same amount. And then the owner said, didn't we agree on that? I thought we agreed that I'd, I'd pay you this amount because this is the stereotypical day's wages. And you didn't complain about it this morning, but now you're complaining. And, and instead of seeing what I, give, what I give to you, you don't see the worry that was on their face when no one picked them. You don't see the grace that I'm trying to extend. 
you don't see the mercy that I'm trying to extend. All you see is something that's unfair. And, and we have to realize when we read this scripture that there were more people in the scripture who received grace when they didn't deserve it. I know there's a lot of times in my life when I've gotten things that I didn't deserve, good and bad. One funny example, actually, I, again, I told them about this past Sunday morning in class. It was my junior year of high school, and as most of the recent people who have graduated high school know that you have to take U.S. history your junior year of high school and take a state test on that. And my professor at col or not college but at MSMS said, you know what? This first semester, we're not going to talk about the American Revolution. We're not going to talk about the Civil War. Let's go straight to the captains of industry and Carnegie Steel, J.P. Morgan, all of that. And it was so boring. I, in all honesty, and I, I shouldn't have done this, I, I, but I slept most of every single day of the first semester of U.S. history my junior year of high school. And again, because he didn't cover anything that I thought was interesting to me. And, and lo and behold, I got a C for the first semester in that class. And then after that, we get into World War I, World War II, all that in the second semester, the 40s, the 50s, and so on. And, and that was more interesting to me. And so I actually paid attention. I actually stayed awake. And, and so for the second semester, I got an A. And so for my yearly grade, you know, you'd think, okay, first semester a C, second semester an A, averages out to be a B. He gave me an A for the entire year. I didn't deserve it. But he saw something. He said, you know what? I've noticed you try harder this second semester. I've noticed you actually pay more attention. I've noticed you actually put forth the effort. I've noticed you actually wanted this this time. And so... I'm going to reward that. And, and I didn't deserve that A. I didn't deserve the letter of recommendation that that same professor gave me to, for the college applications that I put in. There's a lot of things that I didn't deserve that I got that was really great to me. And again, I know all of us can testify to the fact that there are a lot of things in our life that, that we got that were great that we didn't deserve. And I also know, again, the flip side of the coin, that there are a lot of things in life that a lot of us have been given that we did not deserve that were bad. But again, I'm thankful that whenever I didn't deserve grace and I didn't deserve mercy, I was wallowing in my sin. I was wallowing in the filth. But God saw me and he said, guess what, son? I want you. Come here. I'm going to give you something that you don't deserve. I paid the price with my own blood. I paid the price by putting myself on the cross for you to be called, for you to be chosen, for you to be brought to the kingdom for such a time as this. And again, I wonder if we can just lift our hands right now and say, God, I'm so thankful. That when I didn't deserve your mercy, Jesus, when I didn't deserve your grace, Lord, you extended it to me. God, when I deserve the wages for my sin, which the Bible says are death, God, you paid that price for me and gave me mercy and gave me grace. And in return, all God is asking us for that price is just to become a laborer in the field. I won't be too much longer, so I will go ahead and ask you to stand all across this house and ask the music to go ahead and making their way up. I'll be just a few more minutes. The Bible records in Matthew chapter 9, verse 38, that Jesus made a prayer request. He says, pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Again, when I was reading over these notes earlier today, I, I began to get convicted. God, is there anybody that I've ever looked at and said, not them? Is there anybody I've ever looked at and said, next time? The Bible records that one day they brought a woman to Jesus. 
who was caught in the very act of adultery. And they were trying to get him to go against what the word says. And they said, Jesus, she was caught in adultery. Should we stone her? Jesus didn't say anything. He just began to stoop down on the ground and take his finger and rot in the dirt. So they just began to ask again, Jesus, should we stone her? She made this mistake after all. Should we stone her? The Bible says eventually he, he just got to a point where, okay, I'm, I'm going to have to give him an answer. And he says, let the one that's, and I know I'm not quoting this word for word, but he says, let the one that's among you that has no sin cast the first stone. And then he just stooped back down in the dirt and kept on writing. I've often wondered what he wrote in the ground. I would look, try to look it up before, never could find a concrete answer. A lot of people would have, have their opinions on what it was and what it could be. But the more important thing is what happened just a few feet away from where he was riding. The Bible says that the accusers, starting at the oldest, began to feel that conviction and begin to walk away one by one all the way down to the youngest until no one was left and Jesus stood back up and looked around and he just saw her standing there and he said Where, where's your accusers and she said they're gone they, they haven't condemned me and he said neither do I condemn thee and he makes an interesting statement right after that that I believe a lot of people leave out Yes, I understand that this world talks a lot about grace and they use it as an excuse to do whatever they want. And so Jesus makes a statement right after that when he says, neither do I condemn thee. He says, go and sin no more. Well, we're, we're flesh, Brother Ryan. I, we're going to sin. But, well, by the power of the Holy Ghost, we've overcome sin, we've overcome flesh, and we can actually live in what he said that this lady can live in and go and sin no more. When she didn't deserve that mercy, when she didn't deserve that grace, he was there. When she deserved the wages of sin, he was there. When she just needed someone to advocate for her, he was there. We're all called to the kingdom for such a time as this. Again, we're not called to, we're not all called to preach with titles. We're not all called to stand behind a pulpit. But every single time we leave this church and we begin to live our daily lives, that is a message that we preach each and every single day. And it's a message that goes into areas that I cannot always go or that others cannot always go. I, I know I may be the youth pastor, but if I tried to walk into the, these schools around here, if I tried to walk into the middle school or to the high school, they'd stop me at the door and say that you're not authorized to go into this place. But every single one of our students, when you walk through those doors and they let you in, you are a living message that you are preaching to the people around you. If pastor tried to walk into most of the job places in this area that we have, then they would stop him at the door and say, you know what, some of the stuff in here is dangerous. You, you can't go beyond this point. It's only for employees. You have to stay right here. But the message that you live outside of this place is a message that you're preaching to the person sitting next to you at lunch or the person that's working next, next to you each and every single day. What does it take to be a laborer in the field? It just takes proclaiming and living the word of God and advocating for somebody. And the best way that we can ever earnestly advocate for those souls is to show them that grace is still flowing that mercy is still flowing, that God is still there, the, the, the vineyard owner is still there 
willing to give out something that we may not have deserved. And so this is how we're going to handle altar tonight. I believe we all know we all know souls that need saved. It wasn't long ago that we all wrote names on our on index cards and we began to pick them up and pray for them. And I wonder if we could get those names on our heart right now. And I wonder if we could actually pray about the prayer request of Jesus that he would send laborers into the harvest. Because it may not be you that reaches that person, but it could be your prayer that activates something inside of someone else somewhere and says, I've got to reach that person. It could be our prayer right now as laborers in his harvest that begins to change the outcome for somebody. I know this world seems like it's a dying, decaying mess. But in all of this mess that we see going on around us, God sees a harvest. In all the filth, in all the scum, in all the dirt around us, while we just see something that's so messed up, it's beyond repair. God looks at it and sees a harvest. And I wonder if there's someone that could come to the altar right now and begin to say, God, however I can labor in your harvest, God, that's what I want to do. God, if it's praying for somebody, let me pray for them and things begin to change. God, let me advocate for that soul. Lord, let me reach for that soul. Let me love that soul. Come on, that's it. What you're seeing is not destruction, but it's a harvest that's in this world. loved ones, we know someone who doesn't have the Holy Ghost. If, if you know someone like that, why don't you just lift your hand across this place. And if there's someone next to you that has their hand lifted up, why don't you join with them and begin to pray. You, you don't even have to know the name. You don't have to know the situation. You don't even have to know what's going on. Because our God is so powerful. Our God is so wise that He knew the need before we ever knew it. He gave the answer before we ever saw the problem. And as they begin to sing again, I wonder if you could just pray with them. Reach with them. 
Put your hands in the harvest with them. The covenant keeping God. You are the covenant keeping God. Yahweh, the covenant keeping God. Yahweh, the covenant keeping God. such a time as this. My, my, my. Uh, we have a few prayer for needs tonight. Uh, at the top of the list is continuation for revival unprecedented. It starts at the altar. It starts at our home. Still believe in God for a thousand souls by the end of the year. Let us remember all the pastors and churches under Brother Lambert, Bishop and Sister White, Pastor and First Lady Lambert, all other requests by the lifting of your hands. <clears throat> Lord, we come before you tonight. We know, God, that you are all-powerful, 
all-knowing God, I pray, God, that you'll step, God, off your throne. Put your foot down, God. Move on these needs, God. I pray, God, covering and anointing, God, for Pastor and Sister Lambert. I pray, God, that you will protect and bless, God, that you will touch and bless, brother and sister, why, God. We pray, God, that you, God, will move in our communities. Let us, God, reach, God, those, God, that are dying lost. We praise you for it. We thank you for it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, announcements. Sunday morning service will begin with pre-service prayer in the fellowship hall at 925 and then move to the sanctuary at 10 a.m. Homecoming in Silsby is next week, starting on October the 26th. Please be in prayer for all those traveling throughout that week. There will be no service here that Wednesday night, but there will be a prayer meeting. Come help uh, help cultivate the atmosphere of revival. Coming up on Sunday, November, <clears throat> Sunday evening, November the 5th is our annual harvest festival. We will be having a chili cook-off. <clears throat> we will need prayer after. Uh, and if you're interested in participating, please speak with Sister Dosha. If you ha uh, would like to buy yard rolling insurance, please get with Brother Ryan or Sister Leanne. It's $10 a week or $30 for the entire month. So you buy three, you get one free. <clears throat> please find someone and let them know how good it is to see them in church this evening, as you were. Uh, anyone who is available immediately after service, we need some help unloading the flooring from the back of Pastor's truck and taking it upstairs. So, <clears throat> young man, uh, gentlemen, if you don't don't mind, we need some help. As you were, uh, I missed I missed one last prayer request. Uh, please keep Brother T and Sister Collins in your prayers. We thank you for it. Uh, sound person, some good going home music, please. <clears throat> <clears throat>